And we were talking about all of the myths earlier and how they had a hydrating base to them. And we were starting to talk a little bit about the licorice and bearberry brightening mist and pigmentation in general. I think it is such a big giant topic and I'm gonna see if you can kind of spin it down into a very small Summarize segment. And condense, yes, so, yeah, do, but, I'll do my best. <laughs> but pigmentation is such a large concern for so many of our consumers. Yes. And when we start to see it on the surface of the skin, that means the damage has already been accumulated for mm -hmm. many years as yeah. you had mentioned before. So what are the pathways of pigment and what can we as providers do to, to help that? Well, you're exactly right. It is a big topic, and those that have you know been in some of our classes before know we spend a lot of time focusing on how to address pigmentation and really also understanding how pigment is produced in the skin. And you know, it's something that I've been studying since I started in the industry. Again, along with formulary chemistry, my grandfather instilled very on early on the importance of understanding the pathways of pigmentation because, as you alluded to, so much of what we see accumulated damage leads to hyperpigmentation. And that can be from, again, ultraviolet exposure, which is the big one, photo damage, as has been, was coined the term many, many years ago. But even the post-inflammatory pigment that we see from treatments or aggressive acne. So, so much of what we're dealing with as skincare professionals is hyperpigmentation irregularities. So understanding that a lot of what we're doing is using enzymatic disruptors. So using tyrosinase inhibitors to block the enzymes that start the tyrosine amino acid to convert ultimately into melanin or eumelanin or even pheomelanin, which is reddish or yellowish pigment. And those are traditional skin lighteners. Everything from, as we talked about, hydroquinone or kojic acid, some of the more sophisticated things, alpha arbutin. You've got newer classifications like phenyl ethyl resorcinol and undecyl phenyl alanine. These are kind of next generation skin lighteners. But really, many of them are focusing on that blocking of the enzyme tyrosinase. We talked a little bit about niacinamide when we were discussing anti-inflammatories and, and B vitamins specifically. That's a bit of a different category. So those are helping to stop the transition of melanin granules into the keratinocytes that house them. So very important to remember that the melanocyte is the cell that makes the pigment. So I use the analogy that it's the factory that makes the melanin and the keratinocytes are the trucks that carry the melanin to its final destination, which is really the surface. So as those cells are transitioning through the multiple layers, everything that makes that a living viable cell is being pushed out. So all the nucleus and the gogli apparatus and things that make proteins and lipids, endoplasmic reticulum, all the things that make that a living viable cell gets pushed out. But what's getting put in is the melanin in those lower layers. And the reason it's going in is for photo protection as the cell reaches the surface. But we can use niacinamide to help to stop that process. So it actually stops the transition of the melanin granules. The precursor, of course, to all that is something that we also discussed when we talked about the licorice and bearberry mist, and those are the alpha MSH MITF inhibitors. And those are things that are helping to block receptors that the melanocyte has to receive the message to make melanin in the first place. So again, a very preventative way of looking at treating existing pigment that we're seeing in the skin. And to really affect change and pigment irregularities in the skin, you've gotta do both. You've gotta inhibit what you're, what's being going to be produced, but you've also gotta to start to get rid of what you're already seeing. So the second part of that, of course, is exfoliation technique and responsible exfoliation technique. Enzymes, uh, everything from dermal planing, which we've talked a lot about, uh, and then, of course, chemical exfoliation, whether it be combinations of lactic, mandelic, uh, salicylic, uh, some many, many others, and we've got quite a few of those that we're using uh, within the line. So doing both, inhibiting production of melanin and also helping to properly exfoliate what we're already seeing. I think it's important to note when we're talking about skin brighteners and with brightening protocols that we have in the treatment room that this isn't an overnight fix and that again a lot of the damage that we've accumulated over the many years is contributing to the pigment that we're seeing. So how do brightening treatments work and are we changing the melanocyte activity? What are we doing in a treatment when we say brightening? Sure. I mean I think it's important again to set expectations with your clients that treating long-standing pigmentation should be a long-term goal. You really need to let them know that it took years, decades to accumulate this kind of damage for the pigment to manifest itself the way it is. 
that doesn't mean that you can't get relatively quick results if you're consistent with the treatment. So um, utilizing again, the home care system, the licorice and bearberry brightening mist, our bright white serum, the white veil brightener, these are all things that contain a very powerful blend of the types of brighteners that we've been talking about here today. So they work very well. There's a great synergy to them all together. They're helping to suppress melanocyte activity. So they're reducing the amount of melanin that's going to be produced, but then also using the cleansing options, things like the amandola milk cleanser, blends of lactic and mandelic acid together, mild exfoliation in, at, home, at home, as part of the home care, and then incorporating some of the treatments that we've been discussing, whether again, it's enzymes, Australian superberry antioxidant mask, which are again, blends of lactic and mandelic, and then even a little bit further in with the more uh, active peels, the Mandeli Clear Peel System, sometimes even the Jesner when it becomes appropriate. So it is, again, important to set the expectations, make long-term goals, make sure the client is you know, taking photos at home, but also being very, very consistent. Above all, sun protection. Mm -hmm. The moment they stop utilizing effective sun protection, even if they're using all of these great products and getting great results, that pigmentation will come back with the first unprotected sun exposure. So really instilling that into the clients is gonna be very, very important for success. And I think it's also important to note that melanin is our body's own protective mechanism against damaging UV rays. Absolutely. So in our regimens, would you ever suggest to use any of the brightening products during the day? Is it an AM and PM application? Absolutely, you can. Again, the most critical piece to the daytime application is going to be the SPF, but there's nothing that says that we can't use that entire system. The issue of course comes for some clients comes down to cost and again, making sure that they can be consistent with that number of products. So, but there's nothing that says we can't use that. There are some ingredients on the market that you do not want to use during day application that could potentially generate some photosensitivity, but we're not using any of those in the circadia line. And maybe segueing into that, hydroquinone has been a staple ingredient. It is very effective, but does sometimes have negative um, aspects to it. So why is hydroquinone so successful and what kind of alternatives could somebody use if they didn't want to use hydroquinone? Sure, I mean, hydroquinone has been around for a very long time. It's considered to be the gold standard for use here in the United States. Most of other parts of the world, we can't use hydroquinone as skincare professionals. There's restrictions, heavy restrictions, to the availability that we even have in other parts of Europe. Australia, you can't even get it in at all. Um, the reason being is that it is cytosol toxic. So it does create this really dramatic lightening effect in a short period of time, but it's also creating a certain amount of damage as it's working. And most people who have used hydroquinone will notice what's referred to as the rebound effect. So when they stop using it, the pigment usually comes back and oftentimes it comes back even worse. All of that aside, I think the biggest danger when it comes to use of hydroquinone is in darker Fitzpatrick types. The higher the percentage, the longer the frequency of use, the more potential we have to develop something called aquinosis. And aquinosis is dermal pigmentation that's brought on by the overuse of hydroquinone. What ends up happening is the pigment ends up making its way down in between the protein fibers of the dermis. And once it's there, it's essentially settled there and it becomes stuck. And there's not much we can do about it once it's there, right? The only thing that we can really do is laser and the candidates that, well, let's just say the clients who end up with this condition are not good candidates for laser, right? They can hyperpigment from that treatment. So my recommendation is to not use it. I get a little bit of heat for this because again, it is one of the most widely used. It is still considered to be safe at a 2% level, um, but most people that use it don't stick with that. They use it for much longer than they're supposed to. They end up with much higher percentages than they should be using. And again, it's the darker Fitzpatrick types that have the tendency to develop this condition. So it's not as well uh, known out there in our industry, but it's a vicious cycle of seeing this pigment issue arise. And again, once it's there, not much we can do about it. Mandelic acid is one of the common ingredients that are used in a lot of our different brightening protocols and also, of course, in the Amandola Melt Cleanser. What makes it so great for pigmentation? You know, Mandelic has been around for quite some time. It's definitely the hero of the industry as far as alpha hydroxy acids right now. We're using it in home care. We're using our cleansing options. We have in the back bar treatments with the um, Australian Superberry Antioxidant Mask, the Mandeli Clear Peel. 
We're expanding into some other additional options with some new launches that we've got coming up towards the end of 2022 and into 2023. Um, I think the, the biggest attraction is the fact that number one, it's a very potent tyrosinase inhibitor, but it's also one of the more gentle alpha hydroxy acids. And some of the ones that help to deal with pigmentation aren't quite as gentle, right? So the fact that it works on both to helping to keep the skin in good condition, but also as a tyrosinase inhibitor is huge. One of the other things that gets overlooked is it's very good at helping to control bacterial content and fungal content. So if you have acne, P acne bacteria, if you have fungal acne, it can help to address both of those. So it's one of those hero ingredients that kind of transitions across different skin conditions, pigmentation, acne, uh, fungal acne. It really is incredible.